I want you to know this morning, you are chosen this morning. You're not sitting here by chance in this church this morning. You are a chosen vessel of God. We have a position as a believer, just like I was telling you. We have that position as a believer that we can call on the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. We're going to start with verse 3, Ephesians 3, verse 23. And I'm going to bring other scriptures in to back up. And I want you to pay attention this morning. And the first verse 3 says, blessed, blessed us in heavenly realms, spiritual blessings. Our position because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Then we're going to go to Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And it's telling us in there, we are chosen and sealed. We are a believer because we have new birth. We have living hope. We have an inheritance that can never spoil, unstained by evil, or fade. Never change. It never changes. You may change, but this never changes. When God calls you, he has blessed you. He has chosen you. He has sealed you this morning. You say, well, what does that mean? He sealed me. Well, when you seal something where you're canning and you still put a lid on top of that canning, it, it, it seals, and if it don't seal, then it's no good. It'll, it'll spoil. But not with Jesus. When he seals you, you, can't, you will not spoil. You're not going to be able to lift that lid off unless you pop it off. Amen? Amen. He'll pop it. You, you don't want to pop it off. You want to stay sealed with him. Amen? You don't want it to get spoiled. And it never does with him. It never fades. It never goes bad. And it says, for our inheritance is put in safekeeping and continues there. Verse 5 says, faith is sealed. It's a safekeeping and continues there. Amen? It's guarded by God's power through faith. Verse 6, knowledge, or I'm sorry, yeah, verse 6, knowledge of our secured position and inheritance brings rejoicing, inexpressible joy. The fact that we have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. Come on. We should be full of joy because we have inherited the kingdom of God this morning. He's waiting for us, isn't he? He's just waiting for the father to say, son, go bring my children home. Bring my inheritance. I want my children here with me. You know, well, lots of us, we, we wait for our inheritance. Well, you don't have to wait for this inheritance, do we? <laughs> we have it right here and right now. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing with expressible pure joy. Verse 7 in Peter says, proof of reality of our faith. Verse 8 says, increasing love for him. The assurance of complete salva salvation. Even though you have not seen him, you love him. You do not see him now, but yet you believe. What we have compared to the people back in Jesus' day. They saw him. They didn't, most of them didn't believe in him. They, they would just, you know, mock him and make fun of him. And, but they saw him. They saw him heal people. They saw him raise up people from the dead. But we are so much more privileged because the Bible said, because you have not seen, we have not seen him physically. We see him spiritually spiritually. But we, it says here, you have not seen him, yet, yet you love him. You do not see him now, but yet you believe. How much greater we are than the people that walked and talked with Jesus. You think about it this morning. They had hands on. They saw him, but yet they didn't believe. But we're sitting here this morning. You're sitting here this morning, and you believe even though you haven't seen him or her because you believe what's in the Word of God this morning. Amen? we got to start to believe. When we speak the Word, we got to believe the Word. We just don't speak it. Some people have it up here, and that's all the further goes. They can quote the Word of God, but what do they do with it? Do they work it? Do they have faith in it? Do they, do they use the Word of God? We need to learn, and I tell you every Sunday when I speak, we need to learn to use the Word of God. Not just read it. It's good. It's great. I tell you, you need to get your Bibles out. You need to be reading your Bible every day because it gets better and better, better and better. Amen? But we need to work the Word. To make it come to pass, we must work the Word. Next place we're going to look is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. 
It's a protection for the believers. We must stand. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's a full armor. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes because he's crafty. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. you got to watch old Satan because he is crafty. He'll use things that looks pretty nice to you. He's going to say, oh, look here. This is so great. Look what you can do with this. Or look where you can do with that. Where you can go with this and where you can go with that. Watch him because he's crafty. He'll make it look like it's Jesus talking to you. But you need to get your spiritual ears on. Get your spiritual eyes open this morning. Because the day and hour that we're in today, we need to be walking with our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes on him so that we know it's the voice of God speaking to us. Amen. We're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 1. We're in verse 4 where it says, He chose us. He chose us to be set apart, holy and blameless. That's a pretty good statement. He wants us to be holy and blameless before him because he was holy. In Psalms 15 verses 2 to 5, he tells us this. He said, One whose life's actions show obedience to God is blameless, righteous, speaks truth, no slander on his tongue, does no wrong, honors those who fear or reverence of God, keeps his oath and his promises. Do you keep your promises this morning? Jesus does. Jesus keeps every promise that he has. He's given you a promise this morning then he will keep it this morning. And he's telling us here, he wants us to be, he chose us because he wants us to be holy and blameless. And if we always quote the scripture out of 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation. You didn't come to him, he came to you. Come on, he came to you this morning, and I'm getting ahead of my message here. Let's go to 2 Samuel 22, 21 to 25, where David speaks to the Lord, where he says, The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness and the cleanness cleanness of my hands. He has rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. That statement, for I have kept. The ways of the Lord. Are you keeping the ways of the Lord this morning? That's very important this morning because if you're going to be chosen and set apart and blameless before him, you must say, I have kept the ways of the Lord. Because it's so easy to go to the right or to the left. But we need to keep that. Amen. We need to keep the ways of the Lord this morning. And he said, David says, I have not done evil by turning from God. All his laws are before me. I have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness in his sight. We have to keep ourselves clean before him. Come on. He's chosen us. He's called us. He's called you. But he's telling you, David's saying, he had to keep himself clean before the Lord. He had to obey the laws of the Lord and keep himself clean before him. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27. It says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. He didn't just give himself up on the cross to make you that you aren't anybody that you aren't cleansed and you're not holy. Come on. He did it for you this morning. He, he gave himself for us this morning. He gave himself up. But what he does is, as you read the word of God, come on, here's the scripture, cleansing her by the washing of the word of God and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. Amen. The word of God cleanses you. Come on, if you <laughs> you get in there and you start reading it and reading it and reading it and read it just like through the book of Psalms, you read through the book of Psalms and by the time you get to the end, you're going to be clean. Amen. You're going to be clean if you're not at your own fault. Come on, the word of God cleans us up. It cleanses everything. It cleanses every sin that's in your life. I'm, tell, I'm telling you people, don't sit we on your duff. Don't sit out there and say, well, I don't have a Bible. Then go somewhere and buy one. Amen. 
Start reading the Word of God because the Word of God is pure. It is true. It cleanses us this morning. It takes us. It keeps us holy before Him. If we keep the Word in our heart, Amen. not just in our head. Like I said before, a lot of people have it up here, but they don't get it down in here. And then the third thing is they don't live it, Jack. Come on. We've got to get it inside of us. Amen? When you get it inside of us, then we're going to want to bring it outside to somebody else. You can't be a witness for Jesus Christ if you don't have the Word in you. Come on. The Word talks for itself. Amen? But number one, you are the walking Word. Come on. You get that Word inside of you, and you walk it, and you talk it, and people will know who you are. They will know that you walk and you talk with him this morning. They'll know that he is your Lord and God. Amen. Colossians 1, 22, verse 22. Holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusations if you continue in your faith, established and firm and not moved. Amen. Ephesians 4, 2 says we must be humble, gentle, patient, bearing one another in love. That's a statement in itself. Amen? Wow. We have to be humble at all times. Now, I know things come up, and we're human. We're, you know, the, the little temper now and then flares up. And today's the Irish day today, and I, I think they had, we all have tempers, right? Not just the Irish. But anyhow, that fl that'll flare up. Your personality will flare up. And God's telling us this morning here in Ephesians, we must be humble. We must be gentle. When we correct kids or we correct adults, we have to do it gently. Not come in their face and start yelling at them and hitting them and slapping them around. No, you don't do that. Jesus, he wouldn't do that to you. Come on. Jesus was gentle. He was humble. He was patient. If anybody was patient, it had to be him. Because his disciples, no matter what he told them, they still would go back and do something stupid. Amen? It's just like God with the uh, Egy Egyptians when, when they brought Israel out of Egypt, you know. He brought them the whole ways across the Red Sea, was giving them the promised land, and as soon as Moses turned his back to go talk to God, they would complain and go right back to what, what they were doing before. So God has to be very patient, because how many times did God come back and forgive them? And think about it this morning, you're sitting here, and God's very patient with you. And with you out there, God's patient with you out there because where would you be today if he wasn't? Because we are just like the old Israelites. We got to serve God. We get to on fire for God. We get going. We want everybody saved. But then all of a sudden, we're just like them. Well, where'd God go? He didn't go anywhere. Where did you go? You leave him. He will never leave you, never forsake you, but we leave him how many times? But yet he's patient with us. He's patient with you. No matter what you do, he's waiting on you. Amen. He's patient. Take us. We don't have patience for nothing, you know. We say, God, well, we want it right now. Well, God says, well, you're not getting it right now. But I want it right now. Yeah. You're not getting it right now. Amen. Right? Yeah. He's he says, when it's my time, you will wait. I will teach you patience. Amen? Amen. Come on. we got to see what he's telling us here. We have to be bearing one another in love. And that's another statement Paul's making here. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes that love runs pretty thin, you know. After somebody does something to you how many times over and over and over and they say well God I do love them but but he doesn't say but he tells us no matter what they've done no matter how many times they've come against you you have to love them Jesus of all people Jesus of all people They've, you know, they chased him out of the city. They've, they've tried to stone him. They tried to kill him. They tried to do everything. But he didn't give up on them. He loved them. Love beyond any love that you could have. And see, that's what Jesus wants us to have this morning. He chose us. You're very important this morning because he chose you. 
You didn't choose, choose him, and you'll say, well, yeah, I chose to be saved, but he, hey, if you weren't here, he, he brought you here this morning. He gave you the desire to be here this morning because he chose you. He wanted you to hear this message this morning to know that you are his chosen vessel. No matter what you've done, where you've been, if you're out in sin out there, God's calling you back this morning. He chose you clear back when you were before you were born in your mother's womb. Amen. What a, that what that what a statement. You know, it's to me that overwhelms me because you know, with our little finite mind, we try to figure that out. We can't figure it out. There's no way because our Creator knew what He was doing. When he knew you were in the womb, he already chose you. He just gave you some opportunity. Come on. He gives us opportunity after opportunity because he knows I have chosen you. And I will, he'll take us back no matter what we've done. Lots of times we don't want to take a friend back because they've stabbed us in the back. Oh, no. We have to love them no matter what because Jesus, Jesus didn't care. He was our. He is our every care. He's there for you today. And we're going to go back to um, Ephesians uh, chapter one, and we're going to go into verse five, and it says, "We are adopted." Oh, you like to be adopted today? Come on. There's kids out there everywhere today are waiting for somebody to adopt them because people people don't want them today. Come on. But Jesus does. He wants to adopt them in this morning. He wants you, his children, this morning. He wants to be your father. His father wants to be your father. He wants to be your brother. He wants to be your guide. He's, he, he wants to take care of us. We are his choice. John 15, 16 says, and this is for my women's fellowship. We have done this for years. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. It's right there in the Word of God. You didn't choose him. He chose you. He had you marked out. He had you ready. He has, you know, some of you out there is out there running around. Where, where am I at? Where, what's God doing with me? Don't question God. Just listen to him. Sometimes all we want to do is run, run, run. We don't want to listen. We don't want to hear because we don't want what he has for us. Come on, we run from him. Somebody out there is running from him today. Hey, it's time. Get a hold of it because he chose you a long time ago. He already chose you. You're already ordained to be what he wants you to be because it tells you right here that he has chosen you. Amen? Amen. And appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. Well, what does that mean, bear fruit? Does that mean... Fruit off of a tree or fruit out of a garden? No. It's telling us to bear fruit, bear souls, bring souls in, get souls saved. Bring in souls into the house of God. Get them to know who Jesus really is. How many fruits have you born in the last year? We look back and some of us, we don't really know, do we? But yeah, sometimes you don't know that you've planted a seed and that fruit is growing in somebody somewhere that you have planted that fruit. That's all we have to do is plant the seed. Yeah. Then God plants it and waters it and brings it forth. Amen? Yeah. And that's what he's calling us to do this morning. <coughs> he wants us to bear fruit. And I have down here, um, by, uh, how do we bear the fruit? By his love. By the pleasure of his perfect will. Romans 8.15 says, Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Not just sons of God. We're daughters of God sitting here this morning. We are his children. You know, he has, he has no... He doesn't respect man better than he does a woman. Come on. We're all created equal. Amen. It doesn't matter what color you are, how big you are, how tall you are, how skinny you are, how short you are. He loves us all the same. Amen. He has no choice. He chooses us for who we are. Okay. Uh, let me repeat that again. Romans 8, 15. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did, <clears throat> for you did receive the Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the Spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. Come on. We chose, he chose us that we can call on him 
through him to the Father. The Father is your Father this morning, your Heavenly Father. You know, you think your, your earthly Father loves you and He'd do anything for you. How much more do you think your Heavenly Father wants to do for you this morning? He's out there for us. He's out there to take us. And he's out there to comfort us and take care of us. Amen? Number one, we're born into the family as a child who needs to grow and develop his position in one full privilege of his practice involves growth in grace. We are God's children. We are his praise and his glory in Christ. We are the ones he loves. You know, sometimes when people first get saved, they think they've got it all together. They think they can come in and they can teach a Sunday school class or they can do this or they can do that. Brother Sexton, you've already been down that, down that road. No, we have to grow in him. It's just like when you're adopted into a family here on earth, a natural family, you just don't go in there and take over the household. The kids today, they might, I don't know, but they, you know what I'm saying? You don't do that. When you become born again, you have to grow. The Bible's saying here, we must grow and develop in him. We just don't, it's like a, I told you last, last time I preached, you know, a baby comes into the, the world, it doesn't just jump up off your belly and start to walk around and crawl on the floor. Come on. It has to grow. It has to, it has to, we have to feed it. We have to give it water. We have to take care of it. We got to change its clothes. We got to, we got to do all that. And it's the same thing with Christ. When you become born again, when you first find God, come on. We have to grow in the things of God. It doesn't come dumped in your lap the first time you get saved. When you get saved, you keep coming back to church. Now, that's just very important. You need to be in a church body where that you have fellowship and you become part of that church body. If you're out there and you don't belong to a church, we welcome here, here to the lighthouse this morning where you will grow. You will come to what God wants you to be. Amen. He tells us we must grow in grace. Because what is grace? We are his favor. That's his favor. We are, you are his favorite this morning. Oh, you say, no, I'm his favorite. And then you look at your neighbor and say, no, I'm his favorite. And then over here and say, no, I'm his favorite. How can that be? There's a hundred of you sitting here and you're all saying, you're his favorite? Amen. Come on. Say amen, people. Yeah. Come on. You are his favorite this morning. He doesn't pick one person separately and say, oh, I'm only going to bless Diane this morning. No. Everybody's sitting in here, or everybody that's out there listening to my voice today, and you love Jesus Christ. He's adopted you in. Come on. We are just like the Jews. We're not Jews, but we're adopted into his kingdom. We are his, and he is taking care of every of us, every one of us. Come on. Come on. You're his favorite today. You're his favorite. All you have to do is call on him because he has called and chosen you. And you. And you. And you. Every one of us in here, he has chosen us this morning. And you are his favorite. Amen. We're going to go back to verse 7 in um, Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to talk about redemption. And redemption is by his blood. He paid a ransom for us. Wow. Redemption power of God. It's by the blood. It's the only way. The blood is the only way. Churches have taken the blood out. They said, it's not a bloody religion. Well, if you can't give me the blood of Jesus Christ, if you can't take the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins will never be forgiven. Come on. Your sins will never be forgiven because that's why he went to Calvary. He shed every drop of blood for us this morning. It's through his redemption. He paid a price. <laughs> he did not owe. For me, 
and for you this morning. So don't say, hey, that's a bloody religion. No, it's not no bloody religion. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing that you can ever have in your lifetime is to come to know him and to know that he covers you with his blood this morning. The sins are gone. They can't, they, we can't find them. We talked about it the last time. They're buried, gone. Come on. It's all about the redemption blood of Jesus Christ. But you know, there's a requirement in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 20 to 20. It says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you and whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Honor and glorify. Show God's character in our bodies. Once we are saved and we're covered with his blood, then we need to start acting like it. We need to start being like Jesus. You know, we used to sing that little old chorus, to be like Jesus. That's all I ask is to be like him. You know, that's a big statement. Whoever wrote that chorus, I sure hope they know what they were writing. Because I'll tell you what, to be like him. And he's telling us, once he comes in and he saves us, it's telling us, we are no longer our own. We are his body. We are his temple. We have to keep the temple clean. We have to keep the temple pure. As we talked at the first part of the message, <coughs> we have to be pure before him. Come on. We're going to make mistakes. But to know, we go right back. The blood. The blood. The blood. Amen. In Revelation 5, 9, it says, With your blood you purchase men for God. Now listen to this, and I love this because it's from every tribe, every language, people from every nation before God. Oh my. People say, well, you got to worship this God, and you got to worship that God, and you got to worship this God. No, 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 no. There is only one God. Only one God this morning, people. Only one God. There's no other gods besides him. Amen. Because he gave his blood for you this morning. He characterized you this morning. He adopted you in this morning. Come on. He's chosen you. He's called you. He's sealed you this morning. Come on. There's no other God. He says that he has purchased his blood for every tribe. Every language, every nation, every religion. Come on. That word is religion. That's all it is. It isn't God. God is who God is. God is not a religion. God is who we worship and who we praise. Amen. We don't lift man up. We don't lift the man up and bow down and worship to him. We worship the only God there is. And he's speaking out to every tribe and every tongue. Our nation's in such a mess today because they can't bring anything into unity. This one wants to do this, and this one wants to do that. But listen to me, people. There is only one God. Only one God. And he's calling today. He's calling out there today. Out to you people out there, whoever's listening to this message today. It doesn't matter what tribe you came from. It doesn't matter what nations you're from. It doesn't matter whether you're white, you're black, you're pink, you're blue, or you're yellow hair. Amen. Come on. He doesn't care because he purchased you with his blood. That's a scripture saying, with your blood you purchase men from, for God from every tribe, language, people from every nation. Amen. What a word. Yeah. That's coming out of the word of God. If you don't believe me, go to Revelations chapter 5 verse 9 out there. Get your Bible out and read it. He's out there for everyone. He went to the cross for everybody. Everybody, it doesn't matter who you are. It don't matter what language you speak. He understands your language. Isn't that awesome? That you would have a God that knows every language in the world? He does. He knows he created you. He created you for his purpose. He's chosen you today. He knows every word that you speak, no matter what language. If it's Swahili, if it's Spanish, if it's French, he knows everything. All you have to do is praise him. Ask him to come into your life this morning, cleanse you with that blood that he suffered and gave for you on Calvary this morning. Amen. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you're sitting here this morning and you need a new, fresh salvation this morning. 
We, I tell you that every day. We need every day. We need to come before him and say, God, I know I've probably sinned. But I know your blood wash me clean. No matter what I've done, what I've said, even your thoughts. You know, he knows the very intents of your mind and your heart. You know, people sitting beside you don't know what you're thinking, but boy, God does. God does. Amen? And he's there for you this morning. Amen? I'm getting wound up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Galatians 3.13 says, Released from bondage of sin into the freedom of grace. And 1 Peter 1 through 18.19, I'm not going to read the whole thing. And it says, You were purchased with the precious blood of Christ. You are redeemed. We sing that Lord's song. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's all we need this morning. We need the blood of Jesus Christ he was our sacrifice. Back in the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice lambs, the, the best lamb, the, the firstborn of the lamb. Jesus was Christ, or God's firstborn. He is the lamb of God today. He went for you today. Amen. Romans 3, 23 to 25, he talks about the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. There it is. To all who believe, there is no difference. Amen? Amen. His righteousness comes true, but you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to believe solely in Jesus Christ before you're forgiven of all your sins. And the next verse, uh, in uh, verse 23, said, uh, we know that most of us know that scripture. We all, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but he's there to make the difference. The next word is justified. Freely by his grace through redemption through Jesus Christ. Justified means to secure a favorable verdict, to acquit, quit, to vindicate, to declare righteous freely by his grace, by his unmerited favor, and his mercy. You know, when people come before the judge and they want to know the verdict, they want to know the verdict. Am I guilty? Are you guilty this morning? Bring it before the judge. He'll find you not guilty. Amen. His verdict will be favorable. Amen. He will acquit, acquit you this morning. Get that right. He will vindicate you. And he will declare his righteousness freely by his grace. Only because of his unmerited favor and mercy on us this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Romans 8, 33 to 34. It says, the Father declares us righteous, righteous and we, he will not condemn us. Neither will Christ condemn us because he died and he rose and he lives for us. People around you will condemn you, but Christ never does. People go back 40, 30 years and start to bring up your past. We see that every day on the news, don't we? Every day on the news. I say, dear God, help us. Even people in the grave, you know, they're, they're crucifying some of these priests. That in the grave, let them dead, let them buried. They, had to, they have to make the decision what Christ, they have to ask Christ for forgiven. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. It's none of your business what Jack did. It's none of your business what this Jack did. It's none of your business, anybody that's sitting in here. It's none of my business what you did. It's his business. He vindicates us. He takes care of us. He judges us. He finds us worthy this morning. Amen. He doesn't condemn us. The Father doesn't condemn us. The Son don't condemn us. I know the Holy Spirit don't condemn us because he comes in here and he pricks your heart. He calls you this morning. He takes over when Jesus went to heaven. He said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. So when you feel that pricking in your heart and you feel a drawing in your heart, that's actually Jesus Christ doing it through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some people don't understand that. Well, Jesus isn't here and the Holy Spirit isn't here. Oh, yes, they are. They're here in spirit. They're here pulling and drawing. You sitting here this morning, you feel a drawing and saying, wow, I need to get back to the Lord where I need to be. We all do. We all need to make every, I told you every day, we need to confess before the Lord. Go to bed at night. Lay your head on the pillow, <coughs> pillow and say, Jesus, 
I've done something wrong today. I know I have. But I know through your blood, I'm forgiven. Amen? And he forgives us. All right, let's go to verse 8 in Ephesians chapter 1. And it says, lavished. That means given more than necessary, abundantly, given freely. The riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. My, my, my. He's given us more than necessary. He's given us abundantly. He's given us everything we'd ever need this morning. Amen? He has just, his riches of his grace is lavished upon us this morning. Verse 9 says, mystery, the Jews, that, that the Jews and Gentiles would be equal heirs in the body of Christ. We are heirs of the Father. We are joint heirs with his Son. We are the children of his kingdom. Now, this is a little song we sing. We are family. We are one. We are one. Oh, we are one with people all over the nation if they could just realize and come to that unity and know we just need to be one big family that loves our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Amen. Ephesians 3, 6 says, The mystery is that the, the full gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together one body, and sharers together in the promise of Jesus Christ. It wasn't known in the Old Testament prophecy, but it's revealed in the New Testament by the apostles and the prophets. Amen? Back in the Old Testament, if you weren't a Jew, you, you weren't wanted. Okay? But in the New Testament, when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, and we become adopted into him. We become an adopted Jew. You know what I'm saying? We, we were part of the body of Christ. He adopted us in. He cleansed us this morning. And verse 10 says, All things in heaven and earth, together under the, the head, to bring everything into harmony. The head is Jesus Christ. He already has a plan, the unity that he wants to bring us into this morning. Colossians 1.16 says, All things were created by him. All things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created in him and for him. They weren't created for you. He just lets you use them. Amen? He lets them use them. He created them for himself. He created the earth. He created people can say... That people out there say, well, these atheists say there is no God. Well, I'm telling you what, you start watching, we're running into spring. What happens? New life. New life. That's what's called, well, God wants you to spring into a new life this morning. But that's, that's it, you know. There is life in Christ. There is life from the beginning of the earth. And people try to say, no, there is no God. Oh, yes, there is a God, because I just proved it to you this morning. Amen. When we pray and we see miracles happen, and we know, we have sitting over here, she knows that God healed her almost instantly just standing out in the foyer. My little buddy, I sang to him, Jesus, Jesus. That's all we have to do, because he created it for him. For us to use. Come on. For us to use. He created it in himself, it says. He created it in him and for him. But when we become part of him, then it's ours. Come on. It's ours to use and to do. Amen. In verse 11, it says, In him we were also chosen. We were made for his inheritance. We are Christ's inheritance as he is ours. Verse 12 says, We are the praiseworthy of his glory to show his character, his notable traits, just as we show the character of our natural parents. You know, sometimes we all always joke around and say, Well, do I really act like my dad or do I really act like my mother? Uh, Kathy. Don't comment. <laughs> but we do. Come on. Be truthful. We look in the mirror and say, oh, I do look like her. Or I do look like him. So that's what we need to do with Jesus Christ. I'm bringing a point here. You know, It says it there about our, natu our characters are going to be like our natural parents. No matter how we try to deny it, 
Come on. We don't always like what our parents did, or we don't always like how they corrected us or whatever, okay? But look in the mirror. You people can't see the fingers that's pointing at me. But anyhow, with Christ, oh, I'm getting the point across, you know. Look in the mirror and say, am I like Christ this morning? He chose me. He wants you to act like him. He wants you to be like him. He wants you to show the characters of him in your life. And again, you have a choice. He chose you. But you have a choice. You can walk like him. You can talk like him. You can be like him. Or you can live like the devil. Or you can live for sin. You have a choice this morning. That's what he's telling us. He wants when he, you become his inheritance. When he chose you, you become his inheritance. Then you are like him. Your character should be like him. That's what the scripture is telling us here. That we show ourselves worthy of him. That his character When you go out into the world and you go out to your work job or wherever you go, that you act like Jesus. Come on. Verse 13 says, Having believed, marked with a seal, a pledge, possession safe and security, the promised Holy Spirit. He has a deposit, a place place of safekeeping to assure you it will always be there. A guarantee. It's written in blood for every believer. Amen. We put things in safety deposit boxes to keep them safe. We keep things, places that, you know, we, we want to make sure that not, nobody's going to get in and steal them or take our possessions or, or, you know, or we take our money and we deposit it in the bank so that we make sure that it's in the bank that nobody can take care, take, come and take care of it. But with Jesus Christ, he is our security. He is our position, a safe place. We don't have to have a a metal box to put him in. We can't put Jesus in a box. Some people would like to. They'd like to put him in a box and lock the key and throw the key away. The little kids used to sing a song like that way back. You know, we can't. We better not try to do it either because he is our deposit. He is our safekeeping. He is our guarantee because it's written in blood. It's written in his blood. Blood, amen? Blood stains are very hard to get rid of. So don't try to get rid of the blood stain of Jesus Christ because you can't get rid of it. It doesn't wash out. It doesn't. You could, you could bleach it. You could do anything you want with the blood of Jesus, and it's not going anywhere. It's going to be there for you. It's going to be your safety deposit, amen? The believers guarantee of the security of your salvation and your inheritance is the blood of Jesus Christ. We're coming close to the Easter season. And I love the Easter season. I love Christmas. It's, it's such a wonderful, happy time, knowing that God sent his son down to the earth to be our savior and in, in, as a baby. But then to watch and see him go through life and then to see him suffer on the cross just for me. Just for me. Just for me. For me. For you too. That's right. He has shed his blood on the cross for every one of you today. Come on. He's there for you today. He wants you to take him in. And Titus 3, 4, and 7 says, But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, he saved us. Amen. We can try to be holier than thou. Some people, they think they're holier than thou. You try to talk to them and they quote scripture to you. They can write scriptures all over Facebook. But do they live the scripture? Sometimes you'll correct somebody. And what's the first thing they want to do? They want to throw a scripture in your face. No. If you can't take correction, my Bible says, I won't use the word because I'm on Facebook. (laughs) Everybody knows what the word is. We need to be able to take correction. But when I give you correction, don't throw a Bible verse in my face. When God corrects you, don't throw a Bible verse because he already knows the Bible verse. Come on. We need to learn to take correction because he has saved us. We haven't saved ourselves by nothing we have done. But through his mercy 
by the washing and the rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom poured out on us generously that through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs of hoping of eternal life. Verse 14, we're going down to, it says, deposit guarantee, putting down money to hold something for us. Jesus Christ's blood was ours. Secure deposit. God's pledge that our inheritance for salvation will be complete and finished. Amen. He has finished it. He went to Calvary, and what did he say at the end? He said, it is finished. Amen. It is finished. Verse 17 says, spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom is the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships with Christ and others. In J- that's in James, James 1, 2 to 6. Revelation, enlightening into him to know him better, to reveal secret things of God. He gives us revelation. He gives us wisdom. He gives us knowledge if we ask for it. He chose you this morning. He wants to give you all these things this morning. He looks into verse 18 and 19. It says, the eyes of the heart. And it, I don't have it written here, but it says, are flooded with light, with the light of Jesus Christ. In Proverbs, it tells us, the heart in the scripture is your very center and core of life. Your heart is what keeps you living. We all know that. Anybody who has any common sense, they know, they know that the heart is what keeps you alive. Your heart quits, you're done. Amen? The same way, Jesus knows your heart. He wants your heart this morning. He knows where you are. And if you give up on him, he's your heart. You're going to die spiritually. Not physically, but spiritually. You give up on him this morning. He guards our heart. Your heart is like a wellspring of life. Paul prayed the hope of God's calling, the riches of his, God's inheritance. That was Paul's prayer. Verse 20 in Ephesians 1 says, The great power of God displayed in the resurrection and, <clears throat> excuse me, and exaltation of the right hand, the place of honor and so- sovereign power, the chief priest, supreme in power and authority, if effectual and excellence. In Psalms 110, 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He was a victorious warrior. You know, Jesus was a warrior, and he's coming back as a warrior. Come on. He fought your battles. He's fighting your battles today. But when he comes back, what's he coming back on? A white horse. He's got the sword in his hand. The word of God. Amen. The word of God. People look at it as a physical sword. Pastor used it as a symbol last week. But you know what? This is the biggest sword that you could ever carry. The word of God. Amen. If you don't have a word of God, find one. Get into it. Find it. It's, it's, it's fun to read. If you really get in and sit down and get sincere about it, Tom loves the word of God. And boy, the more you read, the more you want to read. I'm telling you. I never did for years and years and years because I come up in a pastor's home. I'm being honest with you. I depended on my dad to carry me. A lot of churches, people sitting in churches today don't have a Bible. They don't bring a Bible. They don't. Of course, we have it up on a screen now because you can cheat, okay? And it's a good thing. I'm not coming against that. That's nice because some people just don't carry a Bible to church. But they depend on the pastor to carry them through. Excuse me, people. Your pastor can't carry you through. You have to be responsible for your own soul, for your own life, for where you're going. Where are you going to spend eternity? Are you going to read the word and find out where you're going to spend eternity? Are you going to find out that the blood of Jesus Christ is real? If you get into the word of God, you'll find out how real it is. Right, to, right clear into Revelations, amen. Verse 21 says, The rule, exercise authority of control, dominion, supreme authority. That's what God has. In Romans 8, 37, 39, and I like to quote this all the time, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen? Amen. I'm almost finished up here. Verses 22 to 23 talks and said, Christ is the risen head of the church, 
and we are subject to him. We are subject to him. We have to answer to Christ. You don't rule and reign. Jesus Christ does. He rules and reigns. We follow him and we walk with him and we talk with him. He rules. And Ephesians 5, verses 24 to 27 said, says this, We are his body. Remember that. He has chosen you. Amen. You have not chosen him this morning. Amen. He's come. He gave himself for us, the church, to make us holy. <coughs> and here it is again. Cleansing us with the water through the word to present us the church to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. Here it is. But holy and blameless. It says everything is under our feet as the body of Christ. It said on back in the scripture, it's all under Christ's feet. God told him, the Father told him, it's under your feet. Well, you know what? Christ is in you. Christ is in you today. The Satan is under your feet. The enemy of life, any, any things that come against you, people come against you. You're not going to put people under your feet. You're going to put the enemy, the spirit of hate. That the, our country is so full of hate. And we need to take that spirit and put it on, stomp it under our feet and say, no, Christ is love. Our nation was built on Jesus Christ. That's the only place. Jesus Christ is the head. And no matter whether it's in the church or where it is, Jesus Christ is the head of the United States of America. He's the head of every nation around the world. And it's time, people out there, it's time you find out that God is the head. God is the head. We cannot deny it. He made, he called us to be chosen for him, but he's making us clean and pure before him. But he's the head. Nothing goes unless he does it. And I'm telling you people, people out there, you're in for a big surprise because God is about to bring judgment. It starts first in the house of God, and you see it in a lot of the churches. Then, world, you better get ready, world, because he's coming. He's going to put judgment on this earth before he comes back to take us home. Come on. What a sinful world we live in. Sodom and Gomorrah had nothing on the United States of America. I can, I'm saying that right out in public. I don't care what they say. It's time for God to judge America. Come on. It's time for our God, and it's coming. It's coming. You better get ready out there, because I'll tell you what, if you're not ready, he's going to judge you, and you don't want God to judge you. If you think judges in the, in, in the courts are tough, you wait. You've seen nothing yet. You've seen nothing yet. He'll take you out one way or the other if you don't serve him. But he's here today. He's calling to you today. It's through his blood. It's through his blood. Amen. Only through his blood. I'm repeating that on purpose. It's only through his blood that you can be saved, that you can be forgiven. Amen? And that's what it's all about today. Come on. Man, he chose us. He wants us to serve him. He wants us to live for him this morning. Amen. Amen. Every day of our lives. He's chosen us. He's given us new birth. He's given us a living hope. He's given us an inheritance. He's called us to be holy and blameless. We are adopted. I love that part. I love being adopted into Jesus Christ. Amen. I love being a Jew. I have, I have a, I don't have it on today, but I wear it almost all the time. I wear my star of David because I am a, an inherited, I'm an inherited Jew. I'm adopted into Jesus Christ this morning. Amen. We are his praise and glory. You are his praise and glory. He loves it when you come. He wants to hear you praise him. He wants to hear you worship him this morning. Come on. He wants you to lift your hands to him and tell him, Father, <coughs> Son, Jesus Christ, you are worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. You look through your life and see the things that he has done for us and taken care of us and brought us to where we are today. He is worthy of our praise and glory. We have the only place we have redemption is through his blood. He purchased us. He removed from the curse of the law. He released us. He, ju he justified, declared righteousness by grace, by his favor. He made a sacrifice. His blood gives us the gift of righteousness. It demonstrates the heart of the gospel of our Savior. He has forbearance, 
patience, forgiveness. I like that part. I'm telling you, you sometimes you look at somebody and say, I'll, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. You know? No. I know we're human. We don't forget. But God does. He has forgiveness and forgetfulness. Amen. All right. And then the next one, he lavished upon us, given us more than necessary of his grace and his wisdom. And now, and he shows us the mysteries, which is equal to the heirs with him. All things under one head is Christ. Everybody's under Jesus Christ. In him we are made for his inheritance. Having believed, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, our security of salvation, our guarantee. He's made a deposit in us. He guarantees us of our inheritance, our salvation, our complete down payment by his blood. We know eternity is ours. Amen? Amen. We know you're sitting here this morning and you've been saved through the blood. The Holy Spirit has called you in that you know where you're going this morning. Eternity is yours this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. Just thank you. <clears throat> thank the Lord this morning. That it's only through his blood. It's only through his blood that you can make it today. Amen? Amen. If you're out there today, and I'm still on streamline, if you're out there today, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and even sitting here today, maybe you've been saved once and backslidden, but it's never too late. God is waiting because it's only through his blood. And if you're out there today, all you have to do is say, Jesus, come into my heart. Make me new. Make me clean. And as you're sitting here this morning, when we go to dismiss, we're going to have a prayer. But I want to have a prayer over the streamlined. And we're going to ask Jesus to come into our heart. Yes. Jesus, this morning, we ask you, as a sinner, as a backslider, to come into our hearts afresh and anew today. Start a new day off today. Make us clean before you. That we may walk and we may talk and be like you. Be like you as you walk the earth. That we may minister to people and that they might find you, Jesus, as they see my life as I give my heart to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.